Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Today we're visiting the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. The museum is celebrating its 75th anniversary with a special exhibition entitled Lasting Legacies, The First 75 Years. The exhibition opened January 24th and runs through April 12th, 2009. We're beginning the show here in the beautiful lobby of the museum with Jill Hartz, executive director. Jill, thanks very much for allowing us to do the show here in this gorgeous lobby and among your stunning artworks. Oh, thanks for coming. We're going to ask you to give us a little bit of background before we move into the galleries. This is the 75th anniversary, which is a momentous mm -hmm. milestone. Could you give us a brief history of the museum? I will, and what's been so interesting for me is coming in in August is that I've spent my time reading about the museum history and talking to people and trying to understand why we are where we are now, which is a good place. But it's uh, given me this um, opportunity really to delve into letters and documents and learn a lot about Gertrude Bass Warner in particular, because this museum is here thanks to her. Um, she, as, as you may know, the core of the collection was formed by Warner and given to the university in honor of her husband who had died. Um, and she um, formed the collection, which was primarily Asian art, Chinese, Japanese, some Korean, um, during her travels to Asia. So she wasn't someone who had looked at catalogs, which were not in existence then, and figured out what she wanted to buy. She was someone who actually lived in Shanghai. She had um, recently divorced her husband, first husband, and she was 40 years old when she traveled to Asia to meet up with her brother, who was a journalist, and um, covering the Boxer Rebellion and other major activities in Asia and had gone to um, Shanghai to live and start a new life and had met um, her husband, her second husband there and while there had become immersed in Asian culture, particularly Chinese culture in Shanghai, excuse me, in Shanghai. And then because Shanghai is so hot in the summer, she would spend her summers in Japan. So she would learn about Japan that way. In China, she learned primarily about um, imperial China because it was the last dynasty and everything was starting to change in the modern world at that point. But her connections were with um, Chinese and um, expatriates who could introduce her to um, you know, high art of China and that's what she collected. That's why we have the thrones. We have some major um, ceramics and pieces that really represent the imperial um, age of China. Whereas in Japan, she knew everyday people and you know, became enamored of Japanese culture and how everything has an aesthetic value. So even whether it's you know, the fireman's robe or everyday eating objects. So she started collecting in a different way in Japanese art based on her um, familiarity with what she came across. And then she moved on to Korea which is our other major area of strength in Asian art, through um, someone like Elizabeth Keith, who was a Scottish artist and a friend of hers who created watercolor paintings that are based on cultures in Korea. So it was really with this very personal um, attention and familiarity with the culture she visited and lived in that drew her collecting interests. I understand that she made the bequest in 1922, but it was 1933 before the museum opened. Right. It means that she spent the, more than a decade trying to get the, right. the physical museum off the ground. That's right. right. Um, and I think that there were a lot of um, 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 starts and stops in getting the new museum going and where it would be and what, would, um, what it would have in it. and. Um, I think that thanks to um, someone who um, actually this courtyard's name for um, um, Prince Lucian Campbell, yes. and um, who really championed the idea of having a museum at the university and featuring the Warner Collection in that, um, there needed to be strong advocates and also support from the state of Oregon in helping to make that happen. So it took a while. I think the museum actually. Um, was dedicated in 19, 
um, 32, but um, Mrs. Warner could not actually get it all, the collection installed so the museum could open until 1933, so even then there was a year. But I think there were some real strong supporters that worked very hard and a lot of funds raised from a lot of people. I think it was at that point, you know, the kind of, well, if you look back to that age, I think the museum may have been, was it $100,000 or $400,000? But it was an amount that to us would seem impossible to consider creating a building. Because then you look at the, um, over 14 million that it cost to do the renovation and you know reopen this building as the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art and you see how dollars have changed <laughs> over that's time. A, that's a pretty dramatic way to look yeah. at that span of 75 right. years. Um, Mrs. Warner's original collection numbered about 3,500 yeah, 30, objects. Yeah, around 3,700 objects and she's collected after um, she was ensconced here because she made I think six more trips to Asia with friends and was always mine. So, so she added to the yeah, collection herself right. after the initial gift. How has the collection changed over the last 75 years? I know you're up to approximately 13,000 works now. Right. Is there another large shape that you've added to that initial Asian collection? Well, I mean, the collection has grown in many ways, but the uh, primary other area is Pacific Northwest. And that was thanks to Virginia Hazeltine. Um, who lived in this area, had married um, an alum of the university who was very active, particularly in athletics. And so she came to visit quite a bit, and she had an arts and culture interest. And I think she was stimulated in part by an article that came out um, in a national publication that looked at the mystic artists of the Northwest, um, who included people like Morris Graves and Mark Toby. And at that point, those artists were not very well known. There were very few, even commercial galleries in Oregon. And she had to do a lot of research on her own. But um, thanks to all the research and her interest, she started building a collection of Northwest artists that um, numbered over 100 works, including the largest collection of Morris Graves. And those all came to us along with funds to continue to acquire and build that collection. We're going to move upstairs in a minute, Jill, to look at some of the galleries. But before we close here in the lobby, let me ask you, have you got any idea of the, the general direction you're, you foresee for the next 75 years? Oh, it's hard to predict what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone in 75 years. I know that as the collections are growing, we are um, trying to fill gaps and especially bring it up to the present. So contemporary art across the world, Asian, Latin American, um, we're really looking at how we can stay current with what's happening in art today. So you'll see a lot of changes in that area, a lot more emphasis. And then I think um, we'll see where it goes. Sounds good, and we'll all be watching. I know. We're going to move upstairs into the collections now, and I'll see you again at the end of the program. Oh, that's great. Great, thanks. We're now in the Jinju Gallery with Charles Lockman, curator of Asian art. Charles. Gertrude Bassett Warner was in Asia at a particular historical moment. Can you explain how she was able to bring so many examples of Chinese and other art back to Eugene? Sure, it's a very interesting story. Actually, she was uh, divorced, which at that time was considered something of a social stigma. And so she was, in a sense, kind of sent away, I think, to get out of the country for a bit and let her reputation heal. So she went to visit her brother, who was a war correspondent, who was there covering the Sino-Japanese War at the time. And so she was in China basically during the last decade of the Qing Dynasty, which was a very tumultuous period. This is the period that led essentially to the collapse of imperial China and the birth of the Republic of China in 1910, 1911. So one of the things that came out of that situation is that a lot of objects from the Forbidden City, which were the large, was the large compound where the palace was located and uh, where the um, emperor and this whole retinue lived, uh, many of those objects were literally being sold out the back door of the palace complex by eunuchs and so on to try to get especially foreign currency. So she had opportunities to buy many kinds of objects which were never, of course, intended to be on the market, so to speak. And 
So um, after she amassed that collection, it first went to San Francisco where she lived when she came back from China with her husband. She got married while she was in China. And then through another kind of serendipitous fluke, her son was teaching in the law school here. And so she came to visit him. And while she was here, entered into negotiations with uh, Prince Lucian Campbell, who was president of the university at the time. And essentially, they struck a deal that if they built a museum for her, um, that she would give her collection to put in it. And that's essentially what happened over time. And really, she did run it as her private museum for most of her lifetime. It wasn't open to the public in any regular way. It wasn't even open to students and faculty except by appointment. She herself chose where every single object in the museum would be placed. And in fact, when I first visited the museum in the early 1990s, um, many of the objects in place in the throne room in particular were exactly where they had been. You can see in photographs from the 1930s when the museum opened, they were exactly in the same place. So. I understand she curated the collection herself, too. She did, yes. So the entire collection was built by her. And so the initial core of the collection came from the objects that she had amassed while she was living in China with her husband. But then after she had come back and was in Eugene and now had this idea of a museum some 10 or 15 years later, uh, she then made specific buying expeditions back to Asia. She made many more trips to China to Japan and traveled elsewhere in Asia as well, looking for specific objects to add to the collection. She also worked with many of the most prominent dealers in the US at that time, uh, Yamanaka and Company, which was a big uh, firm based in Tokyo, but with offices all over the US and uh, others like that. So far, we've talked mostly about the China piece of the collection, mm -hmm. but I'd like to talk about the Korean part of it, too. Sure. If I have this right, this museum was the first university museum with the Korean collection and remains the only one with a significant Korean permanent collection. Mm, kind of. Could you? We're, yes. <laughs> okay. we're the, we were the first and remain, as far as I know, the only university museum in North America with dedicated galleries for Korean art. Many other university museums have Korean collections. University of Michigan, Harvard, for example, but they exhibit them in spaces that aren't specifically designated for Korean art. Uh, I've heard that the University of Michigan, which is undergoing an expansion right now, is going to have Korean galleries when they reopen, so they'll be the second museum. Could you talk about the significance of being one of the only institutions or the only one with permanent galleries? Sure. Um, in many ways, Korea has for a long time been kind of the stepchild of East Asia. Uh, when I was in East Asian Studies, which uh, is what my PhD was in, there was really no one in the department teaching Korea. East Asia was understood to be China and Japan. And of course, that's only two thirds of uh, the picture. Korea played a significant role historically and in artistic traditions over many centuries. And that's only been uh, recognized very recently, probably. Uh, as recently as 10 years ago, you could have counted on two or three fingers the number of museums in North America of any type that had Korean galleries. Uh, now, however, uh, it's become quite common. The Metropolitan Museum opened galleries about 10 years ago, Los Angeles County Museum. So all of the big museums now have Korean galleries, but they're a very recent phenomenon. So the fact that Gertrude Warner was co collecting Korean art already in the 1920s um, the first exhibition of parts of her collection actually took place a decade before this building was completed and was actually in what's now Gerlinger Hall. That's where the first parts of that collection were shown. And that included several examples of uh, Korean ceramics. So that was a very uh, early time to be doing that. So the fact that she um, was able to collect many of these things at a time when no one had any interest in Korean objects was obviously very prescient uh, on her part. Some of the objects in these permanent galleries will be identified as part of the special exhibition, yes, I understand. That's right. That's right. Is the screen one of them? The screen is. This screen is one of the highlights of our collection. Uh, this is uh, what's called the 10 symbols of longevity. Uh, the 10 symbols as a theme, this is one of the most commonly depicted themes in Korean art. You find it not only in painting, but in virtually every media that you can imagine, decorating combs, uh, textiles, all kinds of everyday objects. It's really the sort of primary sort of emblem of auspiciousness that you find. Um, so there are many screens um, that deal with this theme, but this particular one 
uh, is an especially good example. First of all, it's much larger than uh, most screens tend to be. Uh, it's also um, executed in a very uh, delicate and detailed style using uh, really thick kinds of mineral pigments here, which you can see. And all of those uh, elements suggest that this is, in fact, a screen that was created in a, an imperial context. So basically, this was a royal commission. This is not the kind of screen that a average person would have had access to or would have been in their home. And in fact, what's particularly unusual about this screen is that it still contains two panels of uh, inscription uh, on at the end two panels there, uh, give a list of names and titles of a group of individuals who essentially uh, sponsored the creation of this screen. And what's interesting is that most of them uh, turn out to be physicians. And in fact, uh, the screen was probably done as a kind of uh, healing device almost. It's almost a kind of get well card for uh, the crown prince who was at the late uh, in the late Joseon dynasty, who was uh, very sickly. And so this was uh, no doubt done to uh, kind of commemorate his good health or <laughs> wish it for him. <laughs> so when visitors come to look at the special exhibition, they'll also be invited to come up to the permanent galleries. Yes, and have throughout a look. the museum, there are uh, objects from the the uh, permanent collection uh, or that are on view in the collection galleries that are really part of the special 75th anniversary. And there's a special little diamond symbol that will be affixed to certain labels to identify uh, those objects. So there are several other paintings in the Korean galleries which are part of that. Uh, in the throne room, one of the throne sets, which is one of the highlights of the collection. Again, something purchased by Gertrude Warner from the Forbidden City. Uh, in fact, that throne set still has palace inventory seals uh, underneath the footrest and the, uh, seat, the seat itself. So it's a quite unusual piece. Sounds great. We're going to have to move into the American Art Collection. Thanks very much for talking to okay, us, Charles. It's been a pleasure, as always. We're now in the Schnitzer Gallery with Larry Fong, Associate Director and Curator of American and Regional Art. Larry, would you tell us more about Virginia Hazeltine's role in the development of the American Art Collection? Well, up until Virginia Hazeltine chose this Fortunate Museum to be a part of, she had this incredible vision of learning for herself the art of her time and of her place. And coming from Portland, that meant a handful of living artists who were residing in Portland at that time, but also artists in Seattle. And she brought this concept or this vision to Wallace Bondiger, who was director of the University Art Museum at that time, and wanted the University and the Art Museum to seriously consider developing, as Gertrude Bass Warner had developed a collection of Asian art to represent the cultures of Asia, a similar collection in depth in looking at the art and artists of the 20th century and of her time. And specifically of the Pacific Northwest? And specifically of the Pacific Northwest. She was instrumental in allowing the museum to acquire the largest public collection of works by Morris Graves. Is that correct? That's true. And Graves was the focus of this interest by Virginia. And, but it wasn't solely Morris Graves. I mean, she was much broader, much div more diverse. And as visitors to Lasting Legacies will be able to see just how extraordinary and diverse her collection is in regards to not only the artists, but the types of art, whether it was painting, drawing, sculpture, ceramic. Graves was an artist who was very responsive, I think, to the fact that at that moment, and this is 1965, there were no museums who had committed to collecting the art of the region in terms of contemporary artists' works of the Northwest. And Graves, through his lifetime, was always very impetuous and, and, and very, very passionate about not only his own art, but um, ways in which his art might be able to enrich the, the understanding of his life, his time, but also his community of artists. So Morris Graves is very much in support of building this collection. 
So he was concerned not only that his own body of work be displayed appropriately, but he was really talking to a community of artists and helping build the right. collection? So what, what had transpired was the identification of not only Morris Grace, but Mark Toby, Guy Anderson, Kenneth Callahan, as being the, the proponents of a regional style in modern art in the Northwest. And so Graves was one of this group of artists. And it's certainly Virginia Hilton pursued all of these artists, plus many more, in terms of bringing their art to this museum. We're sitting right here in front of number one of the Carl Morris mural series. Could you talk about this fabulous painting a little bit? Well, this is extraordinary. And we're very fortunate to have this very distinct painting that is one of nine murals that Carl Morris was commissioned in 1959 to express for the 1959 centennial celebration of statehood in Oregon. And we are approaching next year, our 150th anniversary. And he was asked to represent, in a very artistic way, the history of religions. And so through a series of nine abstract paintings, he came to what I believe was a wonderful expression of the relationship between nature and the forces of, of spirit and the impact that has on people of Oregon in this series of nine mural paintings. And so this is number one, and it has to do with creation, and it begins with this wonderful burst of light. And the other nine, I mean, as a series of nine, you, you begin to talk about congregations of people, you t begin to talk about place in terms of, of architectural archetype shapes in a very abstract way. And what's important for Morris, as well as a number of painters in this collection that Virginia Hazeltine began was, was this idea about modernism and, and its impact on artists in the Northwest. And this is a great example of that impact, that influence. Where are the other eight? The other eight are downstairs in storage. And uh, we had the nine paintings on view a year ago when we brought all nine paintings. It was the first time those nine paintings had been shown since 1959, intact and all together. And they were very site specific to a hall of religions that was constructed by an architect for the centennial celebration in Portland in 1959. And, but we brought them together and, and tried to interpret as much as we could the relationship between viewing and um, these paintings, and specifically about this incredible energy that Carl Morris brings to these canvases. You mentioned before we started taping that this collection also has a lot of prints that show earlier stages or stages that weren't necessarily fully realized. Well, what's interesting about Carl Morris is that most of these painters were painting in their studios, in their homes and residences in, in Oregon, or in Seattle, and in other places in Washington. And so the scale was quite modest. And when it came to the, to the commission, where all of a sudden he is asked to paint things of mural scale, he had to begin to approach composition. He had to approach ideas about elements, formal elements, whether color or shape or texture, in sketches, and so what this museum is very, very adamant about doing is documenting the creative process, the generative materials that lead to such a magnificent painting that people can see. They can begin to understand the process of this making by looking at a series of sketches that we also have in this collection and relating to these murals for the history of religions. So when a viewer enters this particular room, he or she could walk along and see some of the preliminary sketches and then lead up to the culmination in this big mural? Absolutely. And that also addresses the reason why we have such a large holding of works by Morris Graves. So with this archival collection that Virginia Hazeltine helps us assemble, mm -hmm. perhaps fewer than 25% of the over 400 works we have representing Graves creative energy are finished works. The other 300 are sketches and their concepts and their ideas that works executed later as paintings.
So it's a great research and teaching collection. Absolutely, yes, it is. Larry, before we close, I wanted to ask you about an event that you're running that's related to the anniversary exhibit. You are going to be holding an event that focuses on uh, Lawrence, correct? Ellis Lawrence. Ellis Lawrence. Could you talk briefly about that? Well, one of, one of my interests is design and architecture and considering architecture as an art form itself. And we're fortunate at the Jordan Stitzer Museum of Art to live in what I think is an artwork, and that is the original design for this art museum by Alice F. Lawrence. And we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of this art museum, but also we're celebrating the anniversary of this building, having provided access to art in a very aesthetic and artistic way. And so on March 3rd, I want to investigate not only Alice Lawrence's contribution to this campus and to this art museum, but his work as a designer of art. And I've asked two alumni of the University of Oregon School of Architecture and Allied Art, Rick Mather and Brad Klofel, who they themselves have been involved in both restoration and representing the art of the past, but in bringing museums in Richmond, bringing museums in New York, bringing museums in London, as well as in various other cities in the United States up to date and fully functional, very much like we did in our capital project campaign with the addition and the renovation of this museum. And that event will be open to the public too, I assume? Yes, it will. Great. Larry, thanks very much for talking to us right here on the spot. You're Appreciate welcome, it. Barbara. Joe, Charles, Larry, thanks very much for hosting us here today. We're really delighted to have been able to shoot here in the museum, and I wanted to congratulate you on the first 75 years. I hope the next 75 is just as fruitful, and I wanted to remind our viewers that Lasting Legacies, the first 75 years, will run through April the 12th. I'm Barbara Altman for the Oregon Humanities Center. Thank you for watching.